We're looking at pictures as we speak of some of the buildings that did collapse. People were yelling and screaming, running from the building. We're just feeling an aftershock right now, a rather bad one. And just went, and then just fire. What you're looking at right now is the collapse in the freeway system itself. Northridge, Loma Prieta, Silmar, Whittier Narrows. Names seared into our minds. Earthquakes that brought down buildings, took lives, and devastated communities. When the next one is the big one, arm yourself with this life-saving information now. Surviving the earthquake. Prepare. Survive. Recover. Hello, everyone. I'm Hal Eisner with seismologist Lucy Jones here to talk about those three key words when it comes to an earthquake. They are... Prepare. Survive and recover. All three very important things that over the next 30 minutes we'll talk about. We'll take you to areas uh, defining each one of those things to learn how to save property, save lives, and even save time and money if you need to rebuild or repair any damage. We'll start with prepare. What you can do now to protect you and your family, then during and after the quake, what you can do to survive, that's the most critical thing. And finally, recover. We'll tell you about the resources you might not even know are out there to help you when you need it most. As we said, one of the world's best known experts on quakes is with me right now, Dr. Lucy Jones. What is it you always say about earthquakes? The earthquake is inevitable. It absolutely will happen. We just don't know when. But the disaster is not. Now, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that we're making choices right now about how we build our homes, how we secure things within our homes that are going to determine what our life is like afterwards. And that comes to our first of three words, prepare. We're also going to tell you about a web page at eqheadquarters.com that has tons of information you'll need for all three phases, prepare, survive, and recover. But first, a look at the devastation most of us have witnessed at one time or another when a big one hits. It's the stuff of legend. California's first big one on record, at least, the 1906 San Francisco quake. Magnitude 7.9, 3,000 people killed, a city destroyed. The quake made more notorious by the MGM movie starring Clark Gable. More recently, many of us lived through the Bay Area's Loma Prieta quake. There are reports that rescuers are now searching through the rubble for possible victims. Or Southern California's Northridge quake. It's like a war zone. Both cause widespread damage and destruction, but there are so many others. The San Simeon quake that rocked Paso Robles in 2003. Buildings toppled, cars covered with debris. Further back to 1983 and the Colinga quake in Central California. Well, this is my building here. The earthquake took it away. The 1971 San Fernando quake, known to locals as the Silmar quake. I thought that I was going to be killed. I just knew it was going to fall down on us. There's also the 1987 Whittier Narrows quake. That one caused damage across the San Gabriel Valley. You know, make you cry if you wanted to, but it's mother nature, you know. And the quake hit during, of all things, an earthquake drill. Outside. The three words for dealing with a quake are prepare, survive, recover. Let's get started with prepare. Joining us now are Chris Nance with the California Earthquake Authority, Andy Everson, who is with Earthquake Brace and Bolt, and Ken Hudnut of the U.S. Geological Survey. And thank you all for being here. Uh, the point of subdividing this into three sections is to really focus like a laser beam on, on what we want to get out there to the public. So when it comes to preparing, Chris, what do we want to tell people? Well, many people think home insurance covers shake damage, while in fact that's not the truth. Uh, you need a separate policy to cover earthquake damage. Without an earthquake insurance policy, you may be responsible for 100% of your recovery costs. So preparation beforehand is vital. Talking with an agent will enable you to better understand how earthquake insurance works, whether it's through the California Earthquake Authority or any other provider, uh, to know what's at stake if it happens to you. So you're with the California Earthquake Authority. You deal with insurance. Andy, you deal with earthquake brace and bolt, and what is that? 
It's a grant program that enables homeowners to receive a grant from us to brace and bolt their homes to their foundation. When do people need to start looking at their homes and examining those sort of things? Sure. Any home that's really uh, younger than a 1980, so 19, pre-1980 home, is potentially eligible for a grant because they may not have been braced and bolted to their foundation. However, if you have a slab foundation... If you have a slab foundation, then you're probably okay. The building codes required that the house be bolted to the slab. But for anything that has a raised foundation, particularly pre-1940 houses, it's really important to have somebody come and, and look and tell you whether your house has been properly retrofitted to today's codes. All right. Now, Ken Hudnut is with the U.S. Geological Survey, right? USGS. That's where Lucy used to work. I did. Yeah, she did. And she with did a Kim. good job, right? <laughs> she oh, did yeah. a great job. Tell us, from the USGS perspective, preparation, what, what do you look for? Well, as scientists, we're trying to provide information that people can use to make better informed decisions about how they can prepare. So what we do, we prepare maps of the earthquake hazard for the state of California for the whole nation and we make it easy for people to get at that information. So as they're trying to figure out, should I get more water or whatever, we provide them the information they need to make good decisions. Now this may resonate with all three of you, but one, one thing Lucy and I were talking about earlier was the idea that you gotta prepare for fire. Right. When we did the model, Ken and I worked together to create the scenario of a big San Andreas earthquake, and we estimated 1,600 fires would break out because the really big earthquake is on a really long fault and affects many more people. So the gas lines break, fires trigger. Right, and actually 60% of the fires are probably caused by electrical problems. It's not just the gas. But we don't have 1,600 fire engine companies in Southern California. And that means you're going to have to do more of trying to stop the fire yourself. So part of preparation is have a uh, fire extinguisher in your house and make sure anybody who's ever home alone knows how to use it. It's a little daunting, though, isn't it, guys? I just sort of think in terms that you might have to be your own firefighter. But you might. You might have to. Why don't you pick up on that, Chris? Well, uh, so far as insurance is concerned, a fire is covered by your home insurance. Uh, the shake damage is separate, so that's important. So people need to understand that. That's correct. Okay. And, and Andy, brace and bolt. Any any thoughts on fire? Because I don't think we, I don't think I've ever really thought about the idea that I need to be my own firefighter. Maybe in a bad situation. Absolutely. So if your home topples or slides off its foundation, there's a good chance it's going to be breaking any gas lines, which is where a, a fire is going to start. So if it's more secure to your foundation, there's less risk for mm -hmm. a fire following an earthquake. And part of that program, part of what CEA requires for their insurance as documenting that you've been retrofitted, because you get a discount if you've done the brace and bolt, part of it is securing your water heater effectively to the wall so because when if it topples over it's likely to pull right it's got a out. brace you put around it. Final thought, mm -hmm. Ken. Preparation, most important thing for people to think about. Well oh I was thinking I was thinking about with the fire and the special study that Lucy mentioned in Southern California, we looked at the fire following earthquake. We did that also for the San Francisco Bay Area when we did the haywired scenario there. Similarly for the San Diego area, it's been looked at as how would that exacerbate the damage from the earthquake. And so we know that fire following earthquake can be quite significant as a contributor both to the fatalities and the economic impacts. And, and I think we all remember the, the fires after the Northridge quake, they were, they were everywhere. Still ahead, as we continue our look at the three words, prepare, survive, recover, we'll move one space over and find out ways to survive a quake. And we'll take you step by step through one of the important steps to remember when the big one hits. That's coming up. But first, just a reminder, you can get more information at eqheadquarters.com. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. I'm Hal Eisner along with Dr. Lucy Jones. And the simplest advice you can get for surviving the earthquake is drop, cover, and hold on. Let's take a look. When you feel shaking, immediately drop down onto your hands and knees. An earthquake is less likely to knock you over in this position. Then cover your head with your arms, clasp your hands around your neck, bend over to protect your vital organs. 
If you can move safely and a sturdy desk or table is nearby, keep one arm over your head as you crawl to additional shelter. Finally, hold on by gripping a table leg or other part of your shelter. Continue protecting your head and neck with your other arm. But not everyone has time to drop and cover. It all happened too fast for one woman during the Paso Robles quake. I covered that one and I spoke to her husband about his heartbreaking loss. That was back in 2003. As he stands next to his son, Dennis Zafudo is in shock over the death of his wife. I just don't understand it. 55-year-old Marilyn Zafudo is one of two women killed trying to escape the dress shop they worked in. Evidently, the whole front just collapsed just as they were trying to, uh, trying to make the door. When he got there, it was too late. I held her hand, and uh, that was, it was her, and I couldn't do any more for her. How are you doing? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. And I, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to be here. I would have gladly traded places. I wish it would have been me in that building instead of Marilyn. Such a, an incredibly heartbreaking story. You, you know a little something about this, Lucy, right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, both of the women tried to run outside because that's a, definitely our instinct. And then as the roof came off the building, it came down on them as they left the building. A uh, lesson to be learned there, right? Continuing our conversation about prepare, survive, and recover, we move on to survive. Joining us now, Kevin Miller of California's Office of Emergency Services and Mark Benthian of the Earthquake Country Alliance. And thanks for being with us. And... That, that was a heartbreaking story to listen to, and this is kind of what happens when people are trying to survive. Yeah, it really emphasizes why it's important when an earthquake starts, when you feel that shaking, to drop where you are, not to try to move somewhere where people get injured because they're a bigger target as they move or things can be falling. Drop where you are, cover your head and neck immediately, and then if there is something you can get under for additional protection from things falling, do so, get under it, Keep cover, hold on to it. That's something I can speak of from personal experience because during the 1994 Northridge quake, a bookshelf came down, karate chopped me on the leg. I passed out. I literally, I was on the floor, and a neighbor had to come and, and get me and bring me back too. If that had hit my head, we might not be having this conversation today. I mean, what, what's your reaction to the things that people need to know about in securing the things in their homes so they can survive? Yes, uh, there's a lot that you can do ahead of time, securing those tall bookshelves. It's all common sense information, uh, the flat screen TV, you want to anchor that to your wall. And uh, most people are injured by either moving, like Mark said, or by objects falling and hitting them. And people get hurt by broken glass. Absolutely. These are these choices that you're making beforehand. That we talked about it at the beginning of the show. What determines how it comes out. And yeah, broken glass, one of the biggest injuries they see is glass in people's feet. And Mark has a pretty interesting approach to how to sort of be ready for that. Yeah, you, you hear about putting your shoes near your bed, but then in an earthquake, everything starts to move around. So, and also your shoes could get filled with glass. So put them in a drawstring bag or a backpack with a flashlight, maybe a pair of glasses if you need glasses. So you have all that together and then tie it to your bed maybe underneath. That way you don't have to go searching for it. It will move if the bed moves. You can find it and then you won't be able to, stepping into broken glass within your shoes. So offices of emergency services are very, very busy during these periods of time. What do they do? What's going on at those times? Oh, we're responding, uh, checking resources, sending to um, high profile situations, assessing the damage, and responding to life-threatening situations. Now, in many cases, it's hard to get somewhere because of broken freeways or, right. or other issues, and so, no, you know? You know, there won't be traffic lights if the electricity has gone out. You can get gridlock really quickly. You know, after an earthquake, you guys often come running to a seismologist and say, what was damaged? And we go, that's a building. I, I care about waves. These are the people that Office of Emergency Services that actually figures out what the damage is and how to mobilize resources across the state. And there are a lot of resources out there. And that's why this, this landing page is really so important, eqheadquarters.com, that gives people the opportunity to be able to find all the different agencies, your agencies and others that are appearing on the show, to find out what they can do to be safe and to survive. And that, that survivability thing, I, you know, Lucy made a comment at the very beginning, that a quake will happen. Disaster, destruction, that's a choice. So what do you say to that? 
Well, there's a lot you can do right after, immediately following, after you've man made sure that you are safe. You can check your house for damage, check if the electricity, you may need to turn that off. Even if the power comes back on, it could start a fire. If there's a fire, um, extinguish that with a fire extinguisher that you had in place. If it's too big, that's the only time you may need to evacuate. There's also a gas wrench, which, which most people are familiar with that have homes or live in homes, and you just take that and you just turn off that gas as soon as you can, right? Unless you have an automatic gas shutoff valve, which many people can have too, and that can help that so you don't have to go out and turn it off yourself. You know, it, it's interesting. People don't always like to hear about the bad stuff. They don't always like to hear about people dying or, or getting crushed in a collapsing building, but these are important stories. We need to think about it because we have to recognize, we aren't gonna be able to prevent it unless we talk about it. So let's talk about it, recognize this is what could happen and how we can change that picture. Because I think all of us wanna be here in California after the earthquake, but for that to work, for us to be able to stay here and go to work, we need to make sure we don't have too much damage. And there are probably two things to remember. Gas stations are probably going to be closed down because gas stations need power. And if the power goes out, those gas pumps aren't going to work. That's number one. Number two, very important, is you need to have a plan. So periodically, you should check your family plan on who's your contact, maybe in another state. Go to the Facebook page that says, I'm okay. What, what do you recommend? You want to have those plans. You want to be able to practice how you'll communicate in advance. You want to practice by getting trained on how you might, like by joining a CERT team and getting all this level of training that you can have so that when the earthquake happens, you can help your neighbors. It's really important. You also want to, we also want to let people know that there are many ways to protect yourself in an earthquake, not just that, that primary message. If you're uh, someone who's disabled, we have all that information for all the different recommendations. Okay, and that landing page, again, very important. Still ahead, as we continue our look at surviving the quake, we'll move one more step over and we'll find ways to recover from a quake. And we've got a lot of resources, these guys included, telling us what you need to know to recover after you've survived a quake that hopefully you're prepared for. And don't forget your emergency quake kit. You'll need food, a flashlight, batteries. Just check out eqheadquarters.com for more. Check out this quake simulation showing how an earthquake could travel along the southern San Andreas Fault from the desert in the middle of the Inland Empire to the ocean in Los Angeles. We've sped it up a little bit. It would take longer than this, but you get the idea of how far the shaking can spread. And that's really a, a big part of the equation here, isn't it, Lucy, that the, the shaking is what makes everything go crazy. Right, it's the shaking that actually does the damage and a really big earthquake shakes a much larger area that's the key difference when we get to the biggest earthquakes. And of course, the, the shaking, when, when you're nearer at the epicenter, you're going to feel that hard. But as it goes out, it's more of a roll? Well, it becomes more of a roll. But one of the things about LA, we're a big basin of sediment. And those waves come in here, and they get trapped, and they're amplified. And we expect to see quite a bit of damage in the LA basin in the the, the valleys uh, for an earthquake that's relatively far away because of that trapping effect. So we're, we estimate about 10 million people will get the strong shaking that a half a million people got in Northridge. It's pretty remarkable. We're moving on to recover. What to do after the quake if your home or property is sustained damage? Joining us now is Jared Barrios of the American Red Cross and Sushil Kumar of the Small Business Administration. I'll start with Sushil because uh, really the SBA does a lot more than deal with businesses in an earthquake situation. How would you help homeowners? We're the primary source of capital for uh, damaged property. Money. Money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, source of funds, if you will, for businesses of all sizes, most private nonprofits, homeowners and renters and personal property. So, so if I have a home that's been damaged and maybe it doesn't meet the threshold for, for insurance coverage, let's say, just let's say, then I would come to the Small Business Administration and ask for a loan at, at a low interest? That's exactly right. The program is for the underinsured and the uninsured. We always talk about insurance being the primary source of, of first line of defense, if you will. And the second line of defense are your personal resources. In the absence of it, 
underinsured or uninsured, you would come to the Small Business Administration. But you can't do anything unless the president declares a disaster, right? That's exactly right. That's what kicks that in. That's exactly right. Jared. What does the American Red Cross do in these situations? Well, the first thing we do is tell people buy earthquake insurance so you don't have to go to the SBA, but not that we don't <laughs> love the SBA. We're there for people in their hour of need. So Lucy's scenario, right, you're going to have a lot of people who've lost their homes. A quarter of a million households potentially will be displaced. Is that the number that uh, you yeah. guys have come up with? Under that scenario. And so where do they go? Some people can get in their cars and leave if they can get on the road. Some can stay with family members nearby. Many people won't have any place to go, and that's really where the Red Cross steps in. We are uh, the place that with our shelters, with our mobile feeding, we drive to communities to make sure people will have what they need until they can start taking their next steps in their recovery. And the video we're looking at, that that's just exactly what an awful earthquake would be like. You'd have fires, you'd have toppled freeways, toppled houses, but the Red Cross would be out there providing shelters, perhaps at schools or wherever there's a safe place, and also food. You'd be helping the first responders. We would also do, because the Red Cross, like a lot of charities, raise money afterwards. And people sometimes ask, you know, where should I give my money to support this? Um, with the Red Cross, the first place we spend that money is to cover the cost of the shelters and the food. After that, if you give the money to, the, to that disaster relief operation, it all goes to victims in the form of financial assistance. So it's not like the SBA and that you have to necessarily qualify or anything. We give to everybody who has need, and we spread it widely. Uh, it's not going to be enough to replace a house. That's why we encourage people, like the SBA does, to plan in advance so that you have the coverage you need. But we can help. Uh, people maybe cover a rent payment or that sort of assistance and connect you to other forms of assistance, Salvation Army, other organizations. You know, it, it, it is amazing that there's such an army of people that are out there doing this work that we don't even think about. Right. I mean, it's disasters can bring out the best in human nature. It's a time when we, we have a, sh a shared experience of that catastrophe and we turn and we help each other and it really can be a great time. But you know, everything you do before the earthquake to prevent damage is gonna enable you to not only help your family but help your community afterwards. And th there's that getting that message, let's think about it now because we can change what the outcome is. There you go. I'll be back with Lucy Jones with some final thoughts on how you can prepare for the next quake after this. We hope the past 30 minutes helps you prepare for, survive, and recover from the next big quake. We hope it doesn't happen, but we know it will at some point, as Dr. Jones always says, it will happen. It's whether there's... Whether we've made the right choices beforehand. We don't know when the next earthquake's coming. If it's tomorrow, we're as prepared as we're going to be. But if it's two years from now, how much better off could we be? And, you know, we need to do that... And I think the first step, maybe this seems overwhelming, the first step is to talk about it. You can't act on something you haven't really talked about with people you care about. Talk about the next earthquake sometime with your family and decide what you want to do. And make a checklist. Make a checklist of everything you think is important. And just a reminder, you can get much more information online at eqheadquarters.com. And that's it for our half hour. We appreciate you joining us. It's very important information on our special Surviving the Earthquake Thanks for joining us. See you next time.